In 1970, a 28-year-old recent law school graduate became the most wanted woman in America. She's also my mother. I'm Zaid Ayers-Dorn, host of the new podcast, Mother Country Radicals. When I was growing up, my parents were on the run from the FBI, at war with the U.S. government. From Crooked Media and Odyssey, Mother Country Radicals, a family history of the weather underground. Listen to the entire first season of Mother Country Radicals right now, here on Odyssey. It is high. It is far. It is gone. There's no better way to celebrate your favorite MLB team than by visiting Baseballism, the official lifestyle brand of baseball. Baseballism specializes in apparel for men, women, and children, and now offers officially licensed MLB team apparel. For a limited time, get 15% off your next order by using the code PODCAST at checkout. Shop now at Baseballism.com or visit Baseballism San Francisco on the corner of King and 3rd. Baseballism is America's brand. Swing and a drive, right field and deep. Back goes Aquino, it's got a chance, gone! Get out the tape measure, long gone! Fly the W! Cubs fans, it's time to fly the W with Dustin Rhodes and Paul Crawley Jean. Welcome in to another edition of the Fly the W podcast. I'm Dustin Rhodes, executive producer of the Mully and Haw Show on 670 The Score. The guys are on from 5.30 till 10 a.m. now. I take the way from 5 to 5.30. And I'm always joined by my buddy Crawley. Crawley, happy 4th of July to you. Hope you and the family are enjoying a little barbecue, maybe a little beverage, and uh, hopefully some fireworks. Absolutely all of the above. And speaking of fireworks, boy, we weren't expecting this from, uh, if you could have guessed before the series started, the Cubs taking two out of three from the Red Sox. Pretty darn impressive. Pretty darn impressive. Two out of three, Crowley. This is season one. It is episode 12. We're calling this one Boston Beatdown. And hey, two out of three ain't bad. I don't know if it was Meatloaf who coined that phrase. I know Joe Madden liked to borrow it as, as well. We started recording this right after the Cubs Fell in extra innings in Game 3. We'll get to that one in a few minutes, but right off the bat, Crawley, Friday afternoon, the Cubs got their first chance to face off against the Red Sox. Let's take everybody through it and give our thoughts on how that one went down. Yeah, I was there, and I got to tell you, always weird to see Rich Hill. I remember him when he came up with the Cubs and uh, in 2007. He was an integral part of that playoff run. Um But Adrian Sampson versus Rich Hill, it was an interesting matchup, but I barely was in my seat when in the top of the first, Jared Duran uh, hits a solo home run and the Cubs are down 1-0 early. And then in the top of the second, uh, Trevor Story reaches on an error by Patrick Wisdom, Frenchie Cordero singles, Christian Vasquez walks. The bases are loaded, no outs. So Sampson's in some real trouble. But, uh, you know, Jackie Bradley Jr. uh, hits a double, clears the bases. Cubs are down Four nothing already in the top of the seventh, but then Samson settles down. He gets out of the inning without giving up any more runs, and he's going to look good the rest of the way out. Now, in the bottom of the fifth, PJ Higgins is going to walk. Nelson Velasquez triples. The Cubs trail four to one. Simmons flies out. Morel grounds out. Uh, after that, so after the Velasquez triple, uh, when the Morel grounds out, he uh, Velasquez scores. The Cubs are down four two. At that point, uh, Contreras walks, half singles, Wisdom's hit by pitch, and Hill is pulled, and he has to leave the game because of a knee injury, so he's replaced by uh, Tyler Dinesh. He gets an uh, opportunity to um, warm up, but pincher, pinch hitter Rafael Ortega draws a walk with the bases loaded. Contreras scores, and the Cubs are only down 4-3. to three. So that takes us to the top of the six. Cubs are down 4-3, to three, and Verdugo lines out to start the inning. Story singles. Uh, Brandon Hughes replaces Adrian Sampson, and Sampson once again looks impressive. 5.1 innings. He gave up eight hits, five runs. Four of those earned one walk and four Ks. But again, after the second inning, he really settled down and kept the Cubs in it. Uh, Brandon Hughes is going to come into the game. Frenchie Cordero strikes out. There's two outs. Christian Velasquez singles. Story goes to second. Rob Rensford walks, and the bases are loaded. Jared, uh, Jaron Duran who singles, and that will score Story. But a huge play, Uh, Rafael Ortega throws Christian Vasquez out at home. And so that that could have been way worse. And so the Cubs at this point trail 5-3, which takes us to the bottom of the six. 
Higgins strikes out. Velasquez flies out. You got two outs. Andrelton Simmons walks. And then Christopher Morrell homers. The place is rocking. The game's tied at five. That is three straight games with the home run for Christopher Morrell. Uh, the inning's not even over. Wilson walks, half doubles, wisdom walks. There's a wild pitch by Jake Diekman, which allows Contreras to score, and the Cubs take a 6-5 to five lead. The bullpen did a great job. You had Brennan Hughes, who we talked about, Scott Efros, Chris Martin, and Dave Robertson closes it out. So they go 3.2 innings, three hits, zero runs, one walk, and five Ks. So the Cubs take game one. Yeah, that was a great, great day. And, you know, you started out telling the story about how you were at the game. I almost sent you a text and told you to get the heck out of Wrigley when they got down for nothing really fast. I'm like, oh, Crowley did it again. But the bullpen was fantastic, as you just mentioned. Christopher Morrell, oh, unbelievable. That place had to have been going absolute. Were you in the bleachers that day? I was in the bleachers. They they were rocking. It was just such a great crowd. I mean, the Boston fans and the Cub fans, everybody was cool with each other. There was, you know, Red Sox fans represented well at Wrigley. But yeah, it was it was a good back and forth game, and and the Cubs end up winning and flying the W. So it was awesome. Absolutely. So game one's in the books. Cubs win six to five. That was awesome. Game two under the lights, national television audience and Alec Mills, who I said I didn't want to see start for the Cubs again, did in fact start for the Cubs again, Crowley, in game number two. Well, abbreviated start. Alec Mills versus (laughs) Josh Winkowski. Mills uh, gives up a one out double to Rafael Devers and his day is done. He leaves with an injured back. So out of the bullpen comes Mark Leiter Jr. He comes in and pitches 5.1 innings, gives up three hits, one run, one walk, and five Ks. So absolutely came through clutch when the Cubs needed him. And then offensively in the bottom of the second, Patrick Wisdom singles. He advances to sco- uh, second by on a throwing air by uh, third baseman Rafael Devers. Nico singles on a bunt, and Wisdom scores on an air by the pitcher Josh Winkowski. So because of that, the Cubs are up one nothing. Uh, Gomes grounds out, moving Nico to third. And then Narciso Cook, uh, he gets a sacrifice slot fly, and the Cubs are up 2 nothing. Now, top of the six, Jackie Bradley Jr. doubles, Duran singles. There's runners at the corners. Devers grounds into a double play, which allows Jackie Bradley Jr. to score, and the Cubs lead 2-1. Bottom of the eighth, Tanner Houck comes into the game, and with one out, Contreras singles. Nelson Velasquez replaces Wilson as a pinch runner. He steals second. Hap strikes out. Velasquez gets to third on a wild pitch and wisdom singles. Velasquez scores. The Cubs lead three to nothing. David Robertson closes it out in the ninth after giving off a leadoff double. So that was the second save for David Robertson. But the real news, other than the Cubs taking two uh, game, two of the first game, three games out of Boston, was what Josh Winkowski had to say about Wrigley Field. Here's some rookie pitcher, right? And he's asked about Wrigley, and he says, eh, a little underwhelming. Fenway has a presence to it. I really didn't get that here. To be honest, I said to my mom last night, this place is very stock standard. Now that uh, did not go over very well. I mean, underwhelming. I, I mean, you just talked about what it was like in the bleachers when uh, they hit the home run, right? The two-run home run by Christopher Morrell, and you said how great the Red Sox fans were. I mean, that game, Saturday night's game, was not a rocking kind of a game per se, but the place was packed. There were over 40,000 people in there. I don't know what he's talking about. I'm assuming you ha- I've been to Fenway a couple times. You've been, Crowley? I have not, no. You've not been. So I will say this. I won't say that it's just eh, but I was underwhelmed by Fenway Park. I mean, it's nice. It's cool. There's some history. But there are no, I mean, even before Wrigley did their whole facelift, there are no creatures of comforts at Fenway Park. And the seats are very, very small. And they're set in in a way where they don't face the action. You know, like the seat should be tilted to the left a little bit your seat towards home, these are towards like home straight, plate, right? yeah th- these are like straight on like they there is no there is no little turn of the seat it's so bizarre so you have to sit 
like sideways anyway just to see and if you got any kind of hips or rear end to you so yeah i mean again it's a rookie pitcher what does he know i, I mean that that's just about the dumbest thing i've ever seen in my life yeah, you know he's calling his mommy and and you know what you took the l buddy you, you pitched a decent game nothing nothing great i wasn't overwhelmed by what he had um, but to say that Wrigley is stock standard is just, it's a joke. And, uh, you know, I remember, uh, listening, uh, to a lot of great, whether it was Harry Carey, you know, just talk about the magic and beauty of Wrigley field. It's something everybody knows. It's why they're on TV so often in these national broadcast games. And so it, it just was such a ridiculous comment in my opinion. I didn't see many people on social media cry. Probably have this guy's back at all. I mean, no. not even like people out of Boston. No, nobody, nobody had this guy's back. And I saw David Ross after the game just kind of laugh it off as well, like, okay, you know, whatever. You know, he's got a long, <laughs> he's got a long way to go. What does he know? Right. Uh, you know, we, you know, with the new change in the CBA and maybe the Cubs playing Boston a little bit more often, he may come back. He may definitely get some blue, some booze from the Boobirds. Yeah, he will definitely get some booze from the Boobirds. There's no doubt about that. All right, so with that win, Crowley, there was two W's in a row, and that's the Cubs taking their third straight series, which leads us into game number three. It just ended a little bit ago. Crowley and I are recording this for you on 4th of July weekend, right after the game on Sunday afternoon. So we got into Sunday's game, and I've got a text from a couple people like, hey, you know, I know you, you were happy they won too, but let's go for the sweep. And I thought, you know what? Why not? Let's go for the, the sweep. Keegan Thompson's on the hill. How did this one play out, Crowley? Four yeah. plus hours of baseball at Wrigley Field today. Yeah, you, you're you looking at it and you're saying, all right, Keegan is starting, feel good against Connor Siebold, who's struggled. Uh, unfortunately, it really wasn't the Cubs day, especially offensively on the bottom of the first, uh, Rafael Ortega doubles, Wilson Contreras singles, and the Cubs are up one, nothing. Keegan was giving up a lot of hits, but a lot of the hits that he gave up were infield singles that were barely hit off the bat. And just, he just got babbit to death, unfortunately. And that's where things happen in the top of the fourth, um, Alex uh, Verdugo singles to wisdom. So that's an infield single right there. Velasquez singles to wisdom again. So two guys reach on infield singles. There's a wild pitch on Keegan. Um, what ends up happening is Verdugo moves to third. Rob Renz, uh, Renz strikes out. Frenchie Cordero singles on a pop-up. And again, the fact this is called a single, I don't get it, but Morel lost the ball in the sun. It was an easy pop-up and that allowed Verdugo to score and Vasquez gets to the second and the game is tied at one. Bobby Dahlbeck singles, Vasquez gets to third, Cordero to second, Jaron Duran walks, Vasquez to third. But in the whole situation here, you're talking about a 37-pitch fourth inning. Two infield singles, a ball that's lost in the sun, uh, it, it Swarmer's going to have to come and re replace Keegan Thompson. So after that fourth inning, the Red Sox are up two to one on the Cubs. And Crowley, and, really quick, that, that's what was so disappointing, right, is the fact that it took him like 87 pitches to get out of the fourth inning. Too many yeah, pitches. It, too it many walks, too, too many pitches, and, and obviously too many extra opportunities for the Red Sox. Right, and that's where you really need your defense to come up big, and, and unfortunately they didn't, and that's why you have Keegan uh, out of the game early. And, and the bullpen once again, remember it was the bullpen that was struggling for a while. They, there was a stretch where they were just awful – you know, they look good all weekend, and they, they kept the Red Sox off the board after that. In the bottom of the eighth, Patrick Wisdom, knocked down by a pitch, you know, almost gets beaned, and then he comes back and hits a mammoth home run to center to tie the game once 450 again. 450 happy feet. 450 happy feet. Wrigley's excited, but, it, you know, we get into the 10th, and in comes Rowan Wick again, which uh, – you know, we talked about this on the last episode. Was mm -hmm. wouldn't be who I chose out of the bullpen, but at this point, the bullpen's been pretty used up. You had, you know, pretty taxed. So, uh, Wick comes into the game, and and with the runner at second, we have that rule in. Vasquez grounds out. Verdugo, who is the runner at second, goes to third. Bradley Jr. walks. Frenchie Cordero grounds, uh, hits a ground ball to Wisdom, and the throw goes home. They get Verdugo out, and so the Cubs have an opportunity to sweep and walk it off at the bottom of the tenth doesn't happen unfortunately and in the top of the 11th Arroyo walks uh Duran strikes out singing Dever flies out to center it looks like Wick is going to get out of this with two outs Trevor Story hits another infield ground ball it's in between uh Wicks and PJ Higgins who is catching and you know you 
it, you know, hindsight's 2020 Higgins should have called off wick wick called off Higgins. So wick gets the ball and he throws it over to the Reynolds tarp and two run score and the Cubs lose four to two. So the Cubs lose four to two, but let's go back to that play at the end. It also on the replay, it wasn't Bodie was in at first base at that point. Is that right? Mm-hmm. There wasn't much of a, it didn't look like he knew what he was doing either. I mean, he was barely at the bag. There was no target. He and Wick just literally just whipped the ball into like nothing. It was just a bizarre way for that game to end. But hey, Cubs take two out of three. They get the W. But did you agree with me? Something was up at first base as well. Well, the other issue that that Ron Coomer, who's just done such a great job on 670 The Score Broadcasting Cubs fans brings up, is that uh, Trevor Story was way inside of the line. So you're supposed to leave the runners and a, a pathway to throw to, and he's on the wrong side of the line. And I don't know if David Ross asked for a challenge. I haven't heard of the post-game comments just yet because we recorded right after the game. But that was something else, too, is that it, it's hard to but make was, that throw. He was out of challenges at that point, too, right? He's out of challenges, I think. But you can request a challenge in extras. Oh, you can. Okay. So that that's my understanding of well, that's the rule. That's a good point I can by Ron. Check it, but 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 is that you know the video room? Yeah. Somebody should have said. Now the umpires don't have to grant you that, but you can say, hey, can you look at this for us? And that can happen. Gotcha. But all right. But so like we said, two out of three ain't bad. Two out of three ain't bad. Not bad at all. I was in the just don't please get swept, and then I was taking out the broom. So season one, episode twelve, Boston beat down. You're listening. To the Fly the W podcast. I'm Dustin Rhodes, executive producer for 670 The Score, Millie and Haw. We are on 5 30 until 10. I'm always I'm joined by my buddy Crowley. Hope you guys are enjoying a 4th of July weekend as the Cubs are going to get set to take on the Brewers this week. Before we get into that series, though, Crowley, we've got some off the field news, some roster moves that happened before the game against the Red Sox. Yeah, Seiya Suzuki has just absolutely torn Iowa up. He is leaving the Iowa Cubs. He is meeting the Cubs, uh, I'm assuming, in Chicago. And Monday remains the target for Seiya's activation. So it's it's great to see Seiya back. But, man, you know, the, when you saw Nelson Velasquez, he was looking really good out there. I, my guess is Narciso Crook is going to be the one that's going to be sent down. We'll see what happens. But uh, it was absolutely kind of, uh, you know, it's great to see Seiya back. Drew Smiley begins his minor league rehab in South Bend, and Marcus Stroman's supposed to start today for the Iowa Cubs. So good news on the pitching front. Hopefully some reinforcements on the way. Schwindel and Magicals are going to take live BP, and Alec Mills, after that back injury in Game 2, is moved to the 15-day IL, and Michael Rucker was called up on Sunday. Absolutely. The other thing, really quick, before we move into the Brewers, Crowley, what did you think about – our guy playing second base, Christopher Morell. Did you like him playing second, or you want him back out in the outfield? I'm I'm fine with second. I mean, I, I wonder what the final position he settles in, or again, is he going to be a Ben Zobris type of guy that can play multiple positions? But I don't think he hurts you in either position, so I'm fine wherever he's at. I just like the fact, and I brought this up on the last episode that the pitchers have adjusted to Morell. How's he adjusting back? Well. He answered it that series. He did a great job. So as long as he keeps hitting, he's so athletic defensively, he's not a liability anywhere. No, no, he's not. You're listening to Season 1, Episode 12 of the Fly the W Podcast. Dustin Rhodes and Crawley here with you on this 4th of July weekend. We hope you're having a great time and staying safe. So the Cubs took two out of three from the Red Sox. We're calling this one the Boston Beatdown if you will. And now, Crowley, on the 4th of July, the Cubs will be north of the Cheddar Curtain, up at Wrigleyville North, as we like to uh, as we like to call it. And they will be taking on the Milwaukee Brewers, who are on top of the Central. They've got a record of 46 and 35. The Cubs are 13 games back. They're 32 and 47 tied with the Pirates, and the Cardinals are a game and a half back behind the Brewers. So we've got Brewers, Cubs up at Miller Park. I keep calling it Miller Park. That's what I'm going to keep calling it, Crowley. They'll start on Monday. What's the uh, what's the outlook look like for this series? Well, you're, you're catching their back end of the rotation, but again, the, the Brewers have just solid pitching. Their offense is okay. They're very 
they're very kind of streaky, very hit or miss. There's no one player that you're like, oh my god, that guy's a great hitter. But they're when you have pitching as good as they do, it, that's what's going to help them. Game one is going to start at 3:10 p.m. on Monday at uh, Miller Park, and you have Justin Steele going up against Eric Lauer. So the Brewers have seen Steele a couple times now, and you know they've they've uh, uh, Willie Adamas is at six at bats. He's hitting pretty good. Victor Caratini, former Cub, and Christian Yelich hits 4:44 and nine appearances. So not a huge sample size here. And, that, and you're going to see that a lot with the Cubs uh, and their young starters. And then against Lauer, uh, Wilson Contreras, they, they hit him pretty good last time they saw him. So hopefully they can, you know, take game one with Lauer on the uh, bump. That looks like the most winnable game right off the bat. So I think I think the Cubs are definitely at least fly one W out of this one, and it's good. You want to you want to see how they do against. You want these young pitchers against the Brewers. You want to see what they can do on the road against the team in the division that you're going to be looking up at for a while. Yeah, see what they do, and and hopefully they they continue playing. They played pretty well this entire series, and Boston's a great team. You know that 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 to me was so impressive. You know, the trouble with the Cubs is you never know what you're going to get in any given series. So the hope here is that they can perform at, like they did against Boston and, and stay competitive against this team. Absolutely. So what do Game 2 and Game 3 look like right now? I know it's probably penciled in. It's not It's not in stone yet, but what, what do we got for Games 2 and Game 3? Game 2, we got the Cubs at Brewers at 7, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Kyle Hendricks, who has looked very good as of late, versus Jason Alexander, not the sitcom star from Seinfeld, but pitcher for the Brewers is 2-0 two and, two and oh with a 382 ERA. So that th- there's not a huge sample size for the Cubs. Obviously, Milwaukee has seen Hendricks plenty of times. Um, and so, but, uh, you know, he you still have Andrew McCutcheon. He hits 250 off him. Jace Peterson, 421. Uh, Colton Wong, he's seen him with the Brewers, with the Cardinals at 358 so um you know they've had plenty of experience against them and let's hope the cubs can do something against jason alexander yeah these two teams know each other no doubt but it'll be good to see uh, the professor back out there and putting some hopefully another good start to back to back to back this would be a third potentially good start in a row okay game three crawley how's that one looking well we have adrian sampson and and like i said he against boston the first couple innings didn't look good Ended up settling down and pitched pretty well. He's going to get the start against Milwaukee's reigning Cy Young Award winner Corbin Burns, who's seven and four on the season with a 2.36 ERA. This guy, this game's at 1:10 Central Time, so this is a game where you know Corbin Burns is just a really, really good pitcher, and this is going to obviously be the toughest task. Wilson Contreras is at .077 in 13 at, at bats against Corbin Burns, so it might be a good day for Wilson to get a breather. Ian Happ does all right, 16 at-bats, he hits 313. Nico Horner, small sample size, nothing to really go off of. So none of the Cubs have really hit him very well other than Ian Happ. So uh, Milwaukee hasn't seen much of Adrian Sampson. They don't have too many at-bats, but Adrian Sampson for versus Corbin Burns is not the matchup you're looking for. Yeah, that's the game that uh, I could already probably pencil in as the is the definite loss for the Cubs. But of course, that's the game they'll probably most likely win. <laughs> since I said that, I mean, just baseball is is super super funny that way. So yeah, that would good idea. Give Wilson the day off before they head out west to take on the Dodgers for the rest of the week after the after the Brewers series. This is. Season 1, it is episode 12. We're calling this one Boston beat down. The Cubs get to fly the W not once but twice, taking two out of three from the Red Sox. We hope you are having a fantastic 4th of July with friends and family and taking a listen to us as you're getting ready to grill, to get out of the boat, or whatever it is you're doing this weekend. We do have an abbreviated edition this time around because of the holiday, but we will be back with a full edition later on this week, so don't forget to like us, subscribe to us, listen to us, shoot us an email. Crowley's got that email address for you. Yeah, you can follow us on Facebook at Fly the W, at Twitter and Instagram, Fly the W670. And that email address is Fly the W670 at gmail.com. All right, Crowley, that's a wrap. Season one, episode 12 is in the books. Boston beatdown. I never thought we'd be talking about them taking two out of three and being just this close to a sweep. Oh, my gosh. I'm what a difference glad. that would have made. I'm just glad I got to dust it 
off my W flag and fly it. That's all. That's I right. Care about. That's right. And you were there for one of the games, and they won. So we're going to let you back into Wrigley. Uh, I appreciate it, and let's hope for a couple more wins. <laughs>